Hi, I'm Keith McCullough and welcome to another Real Conversation. I think this gentleman's been on more Real Conversations than most and certainly a, a conversation that I always enjoy. But uh, thank you, Jim, for making some time. You don't need any introduction, I don't think. Well, thank you. Great to be with you, Keith. Great to be back, I should say. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, I, I, I don't know where we're going to go with this conversation, mm -hmm. but I know that most people are going to enjoy it. So, I hope so, yeah. So we can go anywhere. And that's the whole point of Real Conversations, mm -hmm. right, where there's no teleprompter, we're not trying to play gotcha or anything like that. Right. Um, you know, that said, like we, we were just talking offline about this. I mean, you've played or people have tried to play that game with you on Twitter, for example, quite a bit, no yeah. matter what the topic, because right. you have an opinion, you have an informed opinion, you have an opinion that people may or may not want you to share. Um, right. So can you talk about that quickly before we get into some of the other big things like the economy and the Fed, sure. uh, like how that's going and, and, and you know what you're up to. Yeah, I'd be glad to. I've been doing it for a long time. I, I joined Twitter in 2009. It, it came out, it was debuted at uh, um, South by Southwest in 2006. That was their coming out party. Right. I joined in 2009, which is fairly early days. And I did it because I had a lot of friends in Washington who were reporters. You know, like they were, yeah. the, you know, Taylor Griffin, Mike Allen, a bunch of them, they were the, they were the top people. And I noticed they were all on Twitter. I wasn't using it. So I said, well, maybe that's the place to be. You know, I'm not a big Facebook guy. Actually, I'm not on it. Um, so I joined uh, and then kind of went forward from there. And it has changed a lot. It used to be kind of friendly and funny. And you could get it. I got in a famous Twitter war with Nouriel Rabini. Yep. It went on for two days or whatever. But, but the trick was, if you, had, if you didn't have many followers, which I didn't, you pick a fight with somebody who does, and then they all follow you. So I was, I was like, a I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> but, he, but people, people sort of watched up. Like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to fight with a pygmy. But I was small, and and so Noriel like expanded my audience, and then we kind of went from there. I was named, uh, what was it Fortune magazine, uh, picked me as one of the top five financial uh, Twitter streams. Yeah. It, along with like the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, or whatever. But the reason for that was kind of weird. I mean, I did have commentary, but. Wall Street was banned from using Twitter yeah. for SEC reasons. Mm -hmm. So all the Aunt Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, none of those guys, women could use Twitter. So I kind of had the, pl the place to myself in terms of finance and it grew from there. But along the way, you attract trolls and attackers, the most famous one. Um, I was featured in an ISIS recruiting film. This is like in oh, 2015, give or take. Um, and they, all they did was they, t they took some interviews I did, maybe this one, not, but, uh, and they, the, but they had very high production value. They had a production uh, studio in, in um, Raqqa, which was their uh, capital. And um, they stuck me in, the, the thing was called uh, the, uh, the, 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 rise of the, 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 um, the Rise of the Caliphate and the Golden Dinar. That was the title. So they stuck really? me in, because I always have a lot of positive things to say about gold. But it was a recruiting film, but this was their monetary policy believe it or not, of ISIS. And they had two uh, currencies, gold and, uh, and Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. I actually did work with the Special Operations Command down in Tampa on the Bitcoin side of it, it was uh, interesting. Um, so, but one night, so I'm kind of night out, so it's like two in the morning, I'm at my screen, <laughs> got my Twitter thing, know nothing about what I just told you. And all of a sudden in Arabic is, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, I'm getting flooded with positive comments from uh, from the Arab community, you know, from Syria and Iraq and all these places <laughs> saying, yeah, you're our hero. I'm like, what? What? <laughs> so I found the video, which has since been banned. You can't find it today, but I found it at the, at the time. And there it was me and Ron Paul, you know, talking about gold, but in the middle of this ISIS film. So I just sat there, but I knew the math. In other words, things, they say, go viral, they grow exponentially. But yeah. the opposite is true. If you can block them, you can radically reduce the traffic. So I was like, block, 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 block. But I, but I thought, every time I block one of these, I'm really blocking 10,000 followers that they may have. Mm -hmm. I don't want this thing to go any further. So that was my uh, uh, live fire exercise, if you want to put it that way, in uh, managing out of control Twitter streams, blocking the uh, mathematical impact of that, et cetera. So I got good at it. And then since then, I've had fights, not, I don't pick these fights, but they kind of come after me. Uh, the Bitcoin people, you know, they have, mm. they have no time for me, so they were blessed me with their laser eyes and all that stuff, because I don't have very many, I, I know it goes up and down and people make money, but I, it's, it's an asset, but it's not money. Um, but the, uh, so, so that was one. Then the Ukrainian, um, uh, they had a U U Ukrainian cyber command. They had an army of several hundred thousand people mm -hmm. and all over the world. They weren't like all in Ukraine, but they were dedicated to being online and trolling anyone 
who wasn't with the program. Mm -hmm. And I was the one pointing out that, you know, Russia's having elections next month, we're having elections, Ukraine canceled the elections, put their political enemies in jail, which sounds a little too close to home these days. Um, and then uh, they're, they're basically run by neo-Nazis. And you say that, oh, you're just name calling. No, they're actual neo-Nazis. Mm -hmm. Do the research. They've got Nazi insignia. They're left over from the Waffen SS because uh, Germany and the SS took over Ukraine. But then the Russians came in and the counterattack on the Eastern Front. And so the communists and the Ukrainians, but the Ukrainians were Nazi, uh, not the sympathizers. They were in the, um, they were in the Waffen SS, which was the militarized arm of the SS, which ran the, 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 the Holocaust. Um, so, you know, Russia won, became part of the Soviet Union, but they, those guys never went away. Mm -hmm. And they hate Russia. They don't, they don't distinguish between the Soviet Union and Russia. They hate Russia. And they had, they've kept those Nazi sympathies. And there was a guy named uh, Stefan uh, Bandera, who was, who was their leader, the kind of intellectual and political leader. Um, and so they called them uh, Banderas or Banderistas or whatever. They're still there. Now, everyone's like, Zelensky's Jewish. You know, come on. I don't know how, I don't question the man's religion, but he's a figurehead. He's a puppet. And the neo Nazis are behind him. That's what the battle in um, uh, Mariupol. Um, uh, was was all Mari Mariupol rather was all about because that was their bastion. They had like a big big steel plant with mm -hmm. twenty. Anyway, my point being, they came after me, so I started fending them off. You know, so I, I just got pretty good at first of all spotting robots. I'm very good at spotting robots because <laughs> very good. At well, it. very it's, experienced. It's, it's, you need well, experience. I'm experienced, <laughs> but seriously, there are metrics. For example, somebody trolls you. Somebody trolls me today. Let's say, well, yeah. I look at the account. They've got four followers, but they've been on since 2010. Well, what that tells you is an on-the-shelf account that was pulled off the shelf. Uh, you, you really, you've been on for 14 years and you have three followers? You must, be, you must not have a lot to say. But the truth is, these are uh, accounts that are kind of on the shelf in the freezer. They bring them out and use them as needed, yeah. but that's another way to spot a troll. So if, if Elon Musk wants to hire me as a consultant or <laughs> whatever, uh, I'd be glad to take the call. But my, my point being, um, yeah, I just have a lot of experience doing it. You got to spot the robots. You got you got to fight the trolls because if not, they'll just ruin your day. They'll just like be too many of them. So. I, I think it's an important, and, and I want to start with that just because I, I know that how we communicate is, I don't know if it's unique, but it's definitely with a view, mm -hmm. right? And it's it's a fascinating thing to see in this world. And I, I said this this morning. I wrote it too, which is it takes zero knowledge to believe something, right? Yeah. Zero experience, zero. But if you want and need to believe it, then there will be plenty of communities, including trolls, bot farms, whatever, mm -hmm. that can perpetuate your belief. Right. And that makes it a very, like, this would be appropriate for the fourth turning, first of all, as Neil I would say, yeah. which is, you know, this is where everyone goes their separate way and just believes what they're going to believe. Right. Now, on the, uh, there's a point to this, which is, of course, the topic of the recession. Right. Now, I'm not talking about the old wall adage that, and you'll hear it all the time, well, every time everybody's predicting a recession, that means that there's not going to be a recession. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, I wake up this morning and our now cast for a Japanese recession is on the tape. UK repeats that they're in a recession. Right. Germany finally acknowledged that they were in a recession that was already reported uh, in the prior quarter. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, you know, China's in a recession. There's, right. So there has been a rolling recession. Yeah. You know, and there's been a U.S. industrial recession, U.S. manufacturing recession. We can go through the Russell 2000s in a freaking depression. Retail sales today, uh, yeah. But, but you still get, you know, that it's almost like you're an evildoer for talking about this. Mm -hmm. Oh, everyone had it wrong. Right. You know, now, look, we can get into the U.S. side of it, but, but what do you, th I mean, I know what you think but, I mean, about recessions, because first of all, you're one of the few people that called the Japanese recession. Mm -hmm. So you're right. Congrats, yeah. you get that one right. We get things wrong. Um, but what is it about that topic? And, you know, it's not like get fighting the, the Ukrainian bots or this. Yeah. You know, but this is a major topic yes. that, that requires major attention and a major level of experience and analysis. Right. Um, I think it's, it's fairly simple. Let's take it from both sides. From the Wall Street side, it really, they just want to sell you stocks. They, now, there are times <laughs> to buy stocks. I'm not anti-stock. But they just want to sell you stocks. So yeah. Everything they do, um, and, and this is... This is taught. In, this has been taught in psychology programs, uh, behavioral economics programs for decades. But now it's become very much the norm. Robert Schilling had a very good book on it, Narrative Economics. But yep. uh, we we talked about that long before that. But but the idea is, you create a narrative. It doesn't have to be true. In fact, most of them are not true. It could be true, but that would be almost like a coincidence. But you create a narrative, and people 
want to believe the narrative. They, they need an explanation for things that are inherently complex. And if you can give them a story that hangs together, they'll believe it. So the, what's the Wall Street narrative? I just wrote a, a column about this last night. So the pivot, the famous pivot, right? They started talking about the pivot two years ago in the summer of 2022. Right. Right. We're not quite there, it was the pivot. Now that they say, well, the Fed's not done raising rates, but they're getting close to done, and as soon as they are, they're gonna pivot to rate cuts. So they were calling for rate cuts in the fall of 2022. The Fed wasn't done raising rates, it turned out to be July 2023. We didn't know it at the time, but uh, they could have raised more, but that, that was the end of it. That was the so-called terminal rate. I mean, just as a quick aside, what's the terminal rate? Well, they define it as the rate which is high enough to bring inflation down on its own without further hikes. Mm -hmm. That's the terminal rate. They made that up. Who says there's such a thing as a terminal rate? <laughs> hey. the, 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 the markets are highly dynamic. The, the, the inputs uh, change all the time. The parameters change all the time. Who says that a, a terminal rate even exists? But the narrative is we're at the terminal rate. So by September or, you know, last year, it was like, OK, they probably are done at this point. But and it wasn't just the, the narrative. It was in in it was after a stock market crash. Yeah, you know, we're old enough to remember that in 2022. Apparently, yep. that didn't happen. Some people are like, oh, I don't know, I don't know what the recessions right. are. Um, but they bet big time institutional money. Fed fund futures, as you'll recall, back then were betting on a rate cut. Yeah, you know, and, and they did it, they've done it twice now. Right. The narrative actually, you can bully the narrative into the Fed almost being forced to believe it, or getting them to <laughs> flinch. Well, and then it just comes, it, it was completely wrong, like both times. But and this is new in our career. Correct, but it's been wrong for two years, almost two years. Right. So, and, and so what was the latest iteration of that? So uh, the, um, the January 31st meeting, j Powell did something. I mean, by the way, I think the Fed is impotent and irrelevant. If you want my view on, <laughs> I do. If you want my view on the Fed, they're impotent and irrelevant. But I watch mm -hmm. them and I watch the press conferences and I write about it. You know, s subscribers are interested. I do follow it. But if, if you ask me if they matter, the answer is no. But, but, everyone, but see, if everyone else thinks it matters, you have to think about it so you yes. don't get run over by a, a, a train. Um, so, but j Powell did something I've never seen him do before, which is he actually said what was going to happen at the next meeting. Now, you can infer that. You can tease it out of a lot of data and you know, read between the lines a little bit. But I've never said, oh, by the way, we're not going to raise at the March meeting. Uh, in, in so many words. It's like, okay, take that off the table. And then they immediately start, well, yeah, they're going to cut. The, uh, uh, sorry, we're not going to cut. I misspoke. We're not going to cut at the March meeting. Uh, don't look for that. And he said that in so many words. And then it's like, uh, well, okay, it must be May. You know, we're going to cut in May and June. Um, well, so, that's, so the pivot thing is still there. Meanwhile, what's actually going on with inflation? And let, mm -hmm. me, let me explain how I look at inflation. It's, well, infl this is like, I mean, this topic, this... Let's 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 go. If, let's finish on the Fed point, sure, and then get to the actual econ, empirical data. Uh, actual data, right? Yeah. Because no, be, every single question, I have to live tweet the bloody thing, and I actually enjoy it now because it's like a comedy. Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, it's not the longest running comedy like CNBC, like yeah. longer than Seinfeld. But I mean, it's like it, Give it it's time. it's like it is it is comedic to watch. You talk about like I mean, inexperienced journalists, they are all asking about the pivot. There right. was no question about uh, is QT still going on? Like any question, no, no other topic. Right. Right. So the thing fed on itself. You know, it feeds on itself with these. You know, again, bringing it full circle. We have these machines. We have these bots. We have these memes. We have these narratives. Right. And it, it's incredible to see how wrong it ended up actually being. The, the, the probability of a Fed cut was 97% six weeks ago, right. in March. In March, exactly. And, and, and that's gone. Now they're May, and it's not going to be May. Uh, I'll, I can come back on June and July, because that has more to do with whether we're in a recession or not, which was your yes, okay. fir first question. The, let me uh, I'll kind of simplify this a lot. The Fed is always wrong. They're always behind the curve. They're the last to know. When the Fed does something, everybody already knows whatever it is they're going to do in response to whatever just happened that they didn't see coming. So that's the Fed. So uh, will they cut rates at some point? Yeah. When? Hard to say. July's uh, maybe. Not in September because it's it's five weeks before the election. They want to. They're they're. They say they don't pay attention to politics. That's nonsense. They're very political. <laughs> they're they're not going to cut rates five weeks before an election, because they don't want to take sides. You can argue both ways. They don't want to take sides. They're not political. They, he just appears on 60 <laughs> Minutes the minute that Trump whispers that he could be political. Right. You know, it's just like so ridiculous. So, so they'll refrain in September, which kind of increases the odds of maybe cutting in July, just to get it behind them. And then we'll see, see in November after the election kind of thing. Uh, probably not June either. 
But, but here's the point. When they cut rates, and they will at some point, it'll be because we're in a recession. The data's there. It's undeniable. And, oh, gee, guess we better cut rates. And it was just a wake-up call from the real economy. It's not, not the Fed doesn't lead the economy. The Fed follows the economy. Yes. As a forecasting tool, it's, it's awful because for, that re for that reason alone. Um, but, yeah, so the pivot crowd is now kind of uh, talking about May. But, but here's, here's what I really don't get. I mean, I know it, but I don't understand it. Why on earth is the pivot a good thing? Why is Wall Street rallying on a pivot? If you get a pivot, you're going you're in a recession. Yeah, that's what that's what that's why they would. Well, they race. think. I mean, it turned. I mean, first of all, if you just follow what actually happened, you had that melt up, which we'll talk about on AI in July. Yeah, and you had plenty of things going moon again in, right. in the equity market. Yeah, put in a local peak for the cycle, and then straight down till October. Russell yeah. 2000 was down 18 percent. Yep. In in. In normal people's accounts, that would hurt yep. a lot. Right? The data was actually slowing at a faster rate. We called it Shocktober. Mm -hmm. um, and then all of a sudden, voila, you, know, you, get your, you get your pivot, pandering to the, to the weakness in right. the equity market, et cetera, et cetera. But it was based on weakening economic data. Yeah. You know, so, now, so, so now you're, you're getting resuscitating inflation data, right. which is the next topic you want to talk about, which is it would be... First of all, it's in my nowcast, but it would, it would be fitting for them to be absolutely dead wrong that they have, in the words of the great Austin Goolsbee, yep. in his own mind, I'm sure you, you have some thoughts on him, uh, former Obama puppet, you know, now, yeah. now he's head of a Chicago Fed. Right. Yeah. It's, it's but deal. he's like, it's been a Hall of Fame year for inflation, Jim. <laughs> like, are you talking to like normal human beings when you say that? Or are you just, well, yeah, like, is... Well, let's start, let's start with the real dummies and then we'll get to Wall Street. Um, so the, <laughs> The real dummies are in the White House, okay? Because they're coming out saying, uh, "Yeah, I don't even start. Give me start with this uh, Super Bowl uh, stag, uh, shrinkflation. Yeah, whatever." The Fed is uh, sorry. The White House has been saying prices are coming down. Okay, they have not been coming down. You can find one out of forty-eight, you know, CPI components maybe, but prices have not been coming down. Inflation has persisted. What they mean to say, and I don't know if they actually don't know the difference, or this is just propaganda. They don't. They, okay, that, I think you're right. <laughs> they mean to say the rate of inflation has been coming down. That's not the same as prices coming down. If the rate of inflation comes down, prices are still going up. Right. They're just going up at a slower rate. So saying prices are coming down is just uh, either nonsense or a lie or propaganda. Take your pick. It's just wrong. But they're not even right about the other thing, saying the rate of inflation is coming down. That's not true because it's been going up. The bottom was uh, June 2023, and it was 3%. That was the bottom. Then by August and September, it was 3.7. All right, backed off a little bit, it was 3.4. And yesterday, it comes out at 3.1. I'm sorry, 3.1 is higher than 3.0. Inflation, um, CP, I'm using headline CPI on uh, year over year, uh, which is how they do it, um, is higher today in the last print than it was last June. So inflation isn't even coming down, it's going up. The Fed has lost, is losing, a uh, better way to put it, the war against inflation. So forget about your pivot. Forget about terminal rate. Um, Your actually, inflation is going up. Uh, now, if you want to be kind and say, okay, it's kind of sideways with some volatility, fine. That's another way to put it. It is not going down. And so, but now what we got to do is, we, Jim, it's not, it's not headline CPI. We got we to talk about, <laughs> the, we yeah. have to change it. You know, it's the shell game, right? Now we have to talk about PCE. Which let's go to Target, let's go outside or Walmart. Let's yeah. ask let's, a, a mom with her three kids. Right. How is the PC inflation in the store today? I mean, yeah. it's like it's such bullshit, man. I mean, they they start using rolling sequential three month. Oh. And yeah. then the rolling sequential three month actually on the last report, which had been going down. If you just use three months and call that the rate, right? You know, it went from three three back to four, which is double yeah. the target. So they right. keep like. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yes. Uh, agree. But it's, so are they going to hang their hat on the PCE now? It's worse than that. Yeah, everything you said is correct, but it's worse than that. So CPI, okay. I'll come back to why I, I use CPI. I know what all these other things are. So then they do core, take out energy and uh, um, uh, food, energy and food. Yeah. The two things that most people spend most of their budget on, and if you include home heating and air conditioning and the energy component in addition to gasoline, so energy and food, take that out. That's what most people spend most of the money on. Uh, and that looks a little better. And then they have super core, which is let's take out energy, food, and housing. Oh, shelter. That's <laughs> sure. a good one. Take core services, for all of you that are really in tune with this, <laughs> core services x shelter. Right. And that's when, that's when, you know, when inflation went to nine on the headline. Right. 
he, Powell's like, we look at core services, yeah. X shelter. Right. Okay, I looked at the core services X shelter there, uh, buddy, and it just went to 4.4 percent, uh, you know, this week. Well, so, but w now we won't talk about that. Well, right. that that's a, that's a very <laughs> even on the ones they pick, they go up. Even with all these games, and then and then pivot. <laughs> uh, I think is the word. Then go from CPI to PCE, and you're right. They have the same, you know, core, super core, whatever. I mean, unless you're living in a tent eating canned tuna and not going anywhere. None of that stuff applies to you. No. People pay CPI. CPI is what everyday Americans pay when they wake up in the morning until they go to bed. Um, and that is the most politically potent one because that will affect people's right. votes. You can talk about Supercore, your PC, <laughs> not you, but Supercore. Yeah, yeah, all you want. Yeah, no housing, no food, no energy, uh, no whatever, no what, uh, anything else, no plumbing. But, um, uh, but that's not what people vote on. They vote on CPI. Yes. So I, I look at CPI. Uh, headline because uh, it is the thing that affects behavior. It is the thing that's going to affect uh, and how people vote in the election. And if uh, mainstream economists and Fed, Regional Reserve, uh, Fed presidents and others don't want to look at that stuff, that's their problem, not, not right. mine. Well, that's a very important point. I mean, uh, in, I guess the, the basic argument would be made, or at least one I'd make on this, tying it to Trump's probability, is that. Okay, you guys want to lie about inflation, right. or you want to move the shell around and define it in different ways, right. then all day long in any debate, if I'm Trump, I'm going to go after whoever, if it's a, you know, somebody who's a, you know, awake or not in the debate. Right. And say, so you're saying there's no inflation. Like, like, yeah. like it's the biggest joke that you could possibly. You I mean the the level of prices are up twenty to thirty percent depending on what your budget is right. you know, in the last three years. Yeah, and I like I like the way you took the second a second derivative, which is true hedge I style, because you said not only are these alternate measures a joke, but they're not even working. Like they're going up. Yeah. So uh, exactly. So you lose every which way. Meaning, meaning the the policymakers lose every which way. Now, how do you, do you think it matters? You know, Powell starts every one of these. Now there's a there's a mania in CPI watching. I think the, the funniest thing to watch is Twitter, actually, when yeah. the CPIs come out, because everyone on Wall Street has a view. Everyone on Good Morning America has a view mm -hmm. on inflation. Nobody has a model. Right. Nobody now casts it stochastically or otherwise. They don't look at the price of eggs up 50% in the last yeah. uh, three months, actually. Um, but a human being would. Mm -hmm. you know, and you, they just talk and talk and talk about it. Meanwhile, like the, the person sitting there saying, uh, they're lying to me. Right. Like that, they know. That, that's a lie. Yeah. There's, if there's one thing that I tweet about that gets bipartisan support by every human being on the planet that, that actually has a name that tweets me back, mm -hmm. X Wall Street, right. it's inflation. Yeah, and that's exactly right. And if you want to boil it down even more, the price of gas at the pump and the price of milk in the, in the supermarket, that's, that, that's, that's the, the essence of it. Because, okay, maybe um, you know, at the end of the Trump administration, gas was... 225 and then it went up to like close to five dollars and maybe it's down to 450 and the white house is crowing about going from five dollars to 450 but it's up from 250 that's the yeah, point yeah, it's more and, and the other thing is this inflation is embedded even if inflation went to zero it's not okay but even if it did hypothetically that's not a price cut the, the, there was the, the cumulative price increases that we've already experienced are embedded they're locked in mm. they're not going away and that, and that still annoys people, even if inflation came down, which it's not, it's going up, as we just discussed. Um, those price increases are there probably forever. And that's what people remember. And, and how does Powell, like Powell, like I said, he starts every single press conference since this mania started right. with, we are here to do this for the American people. Yeah. Bullshit. Right. I mean, really, we're talking about, like, my dad was a firefighter, 38 mm -hmm. years of firefighter, God bless the guy. And, and we, we lived off a of budget. Yeah, you know, we weren't we weren't part of a class. I'm not like some you know communist manifesto guy where I'm like, hey, I'm part of the middle or low class. Right. No, it's just like we just didn't have as much money as the dentist. Yeah. Um, but you know, we get it. The world gets it. But yeah. Powell starts with this bullshit that he's doing it for the people. Now, what would a first of all this bullshit? Yeah. I think we agree on that. But what if 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 you knew that the Fed was gonna if Powell's just gonna like sneak in a rate cut in March? Would you call that disinflationary or inflationary? I would call it uh, irrelevant, but highly political. Okay. Um, I, I, when I say irrelevant, it, it won't matter. Inflation, inflation has a life of its own. It's behavioral. What drives inflation? It's, it's human nature. It's behavioral psychology. Not really, you can look at expectations. It's a data point. Um, but basically, it's what, um, well, it's also the supply chain. A lot yep. of it's coming from the supply side. Um, 
uh, we're seeing minimum wage increases. Uh, with the, there are a lot of things that are going into inflation that are, that are causing it that have nothing to do with whether the Fed cuts rates or not. Mm. Uh, so, so I was, uh, that's, that's why I would say it was a row. Now, that'll be headlines. It'll make, it'll make the stock market go up. Uh, but it won't have any bearing. It has no bearing on the real economy. No, no but, but and, it would, and, and you to would. Do it would be political. In, in two, when Bernanke was panic rate cutting, yep. oil didn't go to 150 because we were in World War III. Right. I mean, the dollar was going down very quickly. Yeah. You yeah. Know, so if you try to devalue the currency, you know, all things equal, my dad's getting, you know, even poorer right. uh, on the margin if you're going to do that. Now, that, that to me, on like rate cuts are definitely not deflationary. You know, you, so you end right. up in this place now where you're like, okay, so so what's next? Like, yeah. or, do you think inflation could go? Like, do you have a view on where it could go before the election? Or, I think it could go higher mainly because oil prices won't budge. Now, I think the the big picture is disinflationary, maybe bordering on deflation, which is a central banker's worst nightmare. Because yep. they say we don't worry about inflation because we'll just raise rates until it goes away. Yeah, it's debatable, but that's what they think. But deflation, they don't have a formula. I mean, QE doesn't work. QE is a joke. And by the way, when I say that, I should be clear, there's a lot of empirical evidence that's come along since 2008, globally, looking at other countries that have done this, that says QE doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And so you can do it. It's for show. You can talk about it. But uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't cause inflation. I mean, we, between, uh, just take the end of the last recession in 2009, or not, not counting 2020, I don't know what that was. I mean, the economy dropped 30% in one in two months. But treating that as um, uh, COVID-related, turning out the lights, not really fitting in any economic model. But going back to 2009, mm -hmm. uh, March or June 2009, the end of the last recession, to the end of 2019, just pre-COVID, and COVID right. was, got crazy. 10 years, mm -hmm. 10 years. Um, the Fed balance sheet went from $800 billion to $5 trillion. That's base money, M0, money supply. $800 billion to $5 trillion. There was no inflation. There was no inflation. They couldn't get inflation. Mm -hmm. The um, annual growth, um, average annual growth for the whole 10 years was 2.2%. Our potential is 3, 3.5% three if we do everything right, have good policy and so forth. When you're growing at 2.2% and your potential is, I'll say, 3 and a quarter, um, that's what Keynes called a depression. And I've said, I don't have to play the recession game. I mean, I know what they are. But I said in 2007, we entered a depression. And we've been in it for, uh, for the 14 years, uh, uh, or 17 years uh, uh, since. Um, and guess what? Japan went into a depression in 1990. They've had, you said they, had, they came out the other day, the data shows they're in a recession. That's right. This is their ninth recession. <laughs> It is. This is their ninth recession <laughs> since 1990. What do you call nine recessions in 30 years? Yeah. I, I call it a depression. Yeah, and there's a great example of unlimited QE. Right. And, yeah, and QQE. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's, by the, that's by the stock market while we're at it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, which has no impact at all. Um, what does have impact is psychology expressed as velocity. In other words, you can have hyperinflation on a pretty small money supply if the turnover goes to three, four, you know, or mm -hmm. 10 or some, some big number, but, but that's psychological. People have to, that, and that does feed on itself. That's more, that's not supply side inflation, that's demand side inflation. Mm -hmm. But the problem with that, is supply side inflation tends to self extinguish. You know, when prices get high enough, they come back down depending on what they are because people will produce more of solidly inefficiencies in the supply chain. But the demand side inflation has no natural cure. It does mm -hmm. feed on itself and grows exponentially. So that kind of psychological change, uh, which, which I don't see right now, and velocity, which feeds on itself, will give you as, yep. much, as much inflation as you want, regardless of money supply. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's why I say that's um, kind of irrelevant. But you have to factor in geopolitics. I mean, there's no, so we're, so we're, building, a, uh, uh, we're building a neural network right now because we're getting all our nodes and factors. But uh, the, the geopolitics are obvious. Uh, I got into a debate the other night with a guy who was like, hey, we could bomb the Houthis back into the Stone Age. I said, well, I got news for you. First of all, they're in the Stone Age. So <laughs> today, Jeez. that's part of your problem. They're living in caves, so they're actually in the Stone Age yeah. right now. And I said, we can't. They've been getting bombed for 30 years by the Saudis, but, you know, the British, us. It hasn't stopped the Houthis, but the Houthis have shut down the Suez Canal. I and mean, when you close the mouth of the Red Sea, you know, other than Jeddah, I don't know, 
what you're doing is closing the Suez Canal. Mm -hmm. uh, so they have closed the Suez Canal. The ships are going around Cape of Good Hope, you know, pretty place, but a long way from, uh, uh, from, uh, from the Suez Canal. Um, the oil will get through, but it'll be delayed, and it'll be more expensive because the transportation costs are huge. The bunkers, the price of the bunkers are going up, and that feeds on itself. Yep. So you're disrupting the supply chain again. So that's a um, that's an inflationary impulse. You can get into a debate with smart people. That's not really inflation; it's supply chain. You know, to me, if the price goes up, it's inflation. But I I, I grant that there are two different kinds: yep. supply-driven and demand-driven. And your greatest danger is that when the supply-driven inflation and geopolitics is part of it, leaches over into the demand side and expectations change, and then it feeds on itself and gets out of control. Yeah. So the short answer to the question is, I don't see um, a decline in the a significant decline in the rate of inflation. In fact, I can see the rate of inflation going up mm -hmm. at least for mo several months, or lo perhaps longer, based on the geopolitics, uh, mm -hmm. and which means there's no pivot. Yeah. Well, that's. I mean. Unless you have unemployment collapsing or you know, right. breaking out, which would, you know, the labor market is what would perpetuate rate cuts. I mean, that's something where he can Correct. say, okay, look, for our whole, for my, your career has been longer than mine. Um, but I'm no, I'm no spring chicken anymore. I've been doing this for a quarter century. It's okay. like my hair is going white, as you can see. It's like, and you have to change, right? Like, if, if I don't change how I play the game and pay attention to all these flow, uh, data points associated with the options market and being so tight and market structure, then I'm going to lose, right? But right. if, but I still have to get the big picture right. Yeah. And the big, the big picture on this point is, it's pretty clear. I mean, inflation. Well, first of all, you can be long inflation. Like I'm long shipping. Yep. I'm BDR, you know, BDRY, which is an ETF for dry bulk shif sh shipping, has been fantastic. You, you don't, you don't have to complain about inflation. You can be long it. That's the point. Right. Well, if you're smart enough. Your long inflation, while well, my dad has to pay for it. Yeah, you yeah. just Keith, you just pointed to the most dangerous situation of all, which is because you said, yeah, well, the Fed forget inflation, for, put it to one side. The Fed will cut rates if unemployment starts to go up, job creation, you know, turns, you know, goes negative. We have, we're losing jobs, etc. And then that's a whole other arcane debate about full time versus part time and real wages going down. And uh, and I always look at the degree distribution. It's like, okay, you tell me an average wage, fine, but I got to average. Like you and Jeff Bezos, you know, and then or, <laughs> or me and, or anybody, um, and that that degree distribution is extreme. So you can't even rely too much on the averages because 90% of the people could be taking exactly. a real real wage cut in a world where real wages are going up a little bit because a small sliver who don't need the money are uh, are, are going up exponentially. Le leaving that to one side, you said if unemployment gets worse, job creation goes down, etc. That's a, first of all, a sure sign of recession. It's almost the definition. Uh, it's a lagging indicator, which means mm -hmm. we're really into in it, it at that right. point. And the Fed would cut. I agree with all of that, but you could still have inflation, and the name for that, as you know, is stagflation. Yep. That's the worst of all possible worlds. And go back to 19, uh, 1979, 1980. What was, this, what was the state of the world? 10% unemployment and 13% inflation. It's, we're, we're like, there is no Phillips curve. It's like it's like the terminal rate. Mm -hmm. I, I understand Phillips was a prominent economist, and I understand that you can compute it. But the last time I looked, the Phillips curve was flat, not much of a curve. But the point being, the Phillips curve is junk. It's junk science because I can you can do a quad chart, and I, I like quad charts, so do I. So does the Pentagon. You can do a quad chart and say uh, high inflation, uh, uh, high unemployment. Because you're in a, in a um, uh, inflation, or you can have high inflation, low unemployment, or you can have low unemployment, low inflation. You can fill in all four quads, and which means that there's no causality. There's there is no correlation. Mm -hmm. So in in I said 1979, 1980, we had high inflation, high unemployment. According to the Phillips curve, that doesn't happen. Um, from 2009 to 2019, we had unemployment came down and then stayed low. And inflation was low. Mm -hmm. Phil Phillips Curve said that shouldn't happen, but they both did. It's in the data, and you can find the other two. These things are like I mean, you, it's, you can it's, fill in the other two quadrants. They're, they're also. so archaic. Like, I know why I got a B plus in Econ 101 at right. Yale because it didn't make sense. Right. 
Like, I, you're, you're, you're sitting there from Thunder Bay, Ontario, son of a firefighter who knows the cost of things, yeah. and here's this ISM curve or these equilibrium <laughs> yeah. bullshit things that they're trying to teach yeah. you. And I just couldn't for the life of me understand it. Now I understand why. Right. Because you cannot, like, the world's nonlinear, as you know. Right. You know, there are jump conditions. There are, like you said, geopolitical risks over here. There's government spending over there. Yeah. It's, it's just an amazing thing. I mean, but back then, you could be, you become famous pre-internet with a slide rule and say, okay, look, I got two factors on a, on a, right. on a two by two model and this is what I'm gonna call it. I'm gonna tell people a story about it. I, I had the same problem. That was my most difficult course. I had a lot of A's that I just struggled a little bit in economics and it took me like 30 years to realize that what they were teaching me was garbage. So the reason I couldn't <laughs> understand it was because the same, same experience. <laughs> but there was also, a, there was almost a sense, and I can't prove this, that they had to teach you a bunch of garbage so that you could find your way to real economics. But most people never found their way. They kept doing this stuff. Yeah. And now they're running the Fed. Um, That's crazy. It is crazy. But you, uh, I always, I, with all due respect, I consider PhD in economics to be kind of a handicap. You ought to get your own parking space for that because uh, they, they, it, what the Phillips curve is junk. The terminal rate is an invention that has no support in a complex dynamic system. There is no such thing. Um, Fed funds target rate. There, there is no Fed funds market. The Fed funds market was in, was invented decades ago or longer, so that banks that needed to meet res, overnight reserve requirements could get money from other banks. Yep. That was what Fed funds were. But we have, uh, I think, uh, six trillion dollars of excess reserves. There is no, there hasn't been a Fed funds market for a long time, because we have trillions in excess reserves. But they're targeting the Fed funds target rate. But what they're really doing, of course, is targeting the repo rate. But they don't even admit that because they call it SOFR, you know, System Overnight Finance. I forget what the rest of the acronym that repurchase agreements, but which they had to invent to get rid of LIBOR. I mean, they just keep making it up. Oh, and 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 the and the they. Yeah. You know, like dare we mention they? I I I find it shocking actually that my our institutional clients. Yeah. Well, now they, I don't think they can fire us for telling the truth because we're too big. I mean, yeah. but in the early days, I, I, you know, now I just plainly. So you know, there's a they, right? Yeah. I mean, if you don't know who they are, you're the you're the idiot trading meme stocks. You right. just think you might as well just go to a casino. Yeah. I mean, uh, currently, yeah, the payouts are high, and you know, the leverage is is epic on this type of thing. But like, really, um, the the other question on inflation that I had, um, what do you think government spending's impact is on structural inflation? Because we've had. Last year, when people say there's no recession on the headline, right. yeah, well, a third of GDP growth last year, which surprised me, I had it dead wrong, mm -hmm. uh, was government spending. Yep. A third. And now you have a $1.7 trillion deficit, almost $35 trillion in debt, and 24% of jobs were government jobs. Right. The prior peak in any period was 12. Right. In the 08 crisis, it was negative 10. Yep. So it's a very different, you might even call it MMT. Well, uh, I would. Uh, a couple things, Keith. Uh, I spent a long time explaining why monetary policy and, and Fed funds target rate and what the Fed does is irrelevant, has no impact on inflation, except for velocity, which is a behavioral factor. Yep. It's nothing the Fed has any control over. So I sort of dismissed monetary policy as having any impact on inflation. Apologies to my Austrian friends, but you know, uh, but it doesn't. But fiscal policy is very powerful. Mm -hmm. Fiscal policy goes straight to inflation because there you're actually handing people the money. Yes. The thing is, creating excess reserves on the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve, who cares? I mean, it's like Jamie Dimon gets a little spread and good for him, but it has nothing to do with the real world. That money's not being lent, it's not being spent, uh, it's not being multiplied, it just sits there, it's, it's sterilized. But fiscal policy is different. When you start handing out checks, people are going to spend it. And what do we have? So we have about a trillion dollars, slightly higher baseline budget deficit. So baseline means if we didn't have any extras, if we weren't like trying to spend money in Ukraine and Israel and Build Back Better and the Inflation Reduction Act and the Green News Scam, uh, if we weren't doing any of those things, we'd have a trillion dollar deficit. But we're doing all of those things. And I and I would and fault, more scummy. <laughs> yeah, more scummy. And I would fault Trump and Biden. Um, so Trump, and at the depths of the pandemic, kind of May, May, June 2020, hands out $1,400. They just gave it to you. You had all you needed was a pulse. You didn't know paperwork. You just got the money. Not to mention a billion, about 900 million, um, sorry, 900 billion on the um, Payroll uh, Protection Plan Act. For uh, basically, if you didn't, if you didn't fire your employees uh, for, uh, for a year. You got a year's salary. The ERP program? 
You get 26 yeah. grand per employee. That's different. Sorry. That, that, is that different? Or th th no, no, you're right about that. There's part. that too. There's, there's that too. <laughs> no, you, you're right. There's that too. Yeah, right. That's, that's a whole scam. Yeah, 1400 bucks is nothing. If yeah. you're actually plugged in, you get the 26 grand per employee. Right. But, but Well, that's right. Those are the serious satellite commercials that, you know, like, yeah. hey, you know. I talked, to, I talked to a really, really smart <laughs> analyst about this, and he's like, I think this is having an impact, but I can't quite quantify it. I can't put my, hand, my, my, uh, my, my finger on it. So I said, I have, an, I have empirical data for you that will actually back you up. And he said, oh, what is it? I said, radio commercials. Because yeah, when, yeah. When you, if you're in oh, the car, yes. the radio commercial, they simulcast the TV, but they don't give you the same commercials because the radio commercials are cheaper. So that's where you, yeah. get, that's where you get the you know, get out of jail free car for tax fraud and all this stuff. But, but they, they kind of faded and the, uh, the REITs kind of faded. And now it's all this, um, I forget the exact name, but the, uh, the, 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 um, the employer retention credit or whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, but but you're right. That's a huge program and a huge scam, as it turns out. But that's in addition to the payroll protection plan that I was talking about, which is in addition to this this stimulus check. So then Trump gets to the end of the term. It's December. He hands out another uh, 600 bucks. So now that's 2,000 per citizen, 300 million people. And then um, and then Biden comes in and goes, hold my beer. And he and he does. He said, if Trump can do it, I can do it too. So he does uh, 1,600 uh, per head in um, um, February 2021, um, and then they kept going because they had the, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, Build Back Better, you know, the Infrastructure Act, all, all the things we mentioned. Well, and then, and then don't get me started on 100 billion, 60 billion more on the way for Ukraine uh, and, um, and, and a lot else. So the, the point is the, the actual budget deficit has been running over two trillion relative to a baseline of one trillion. And you do that for four years, you get eight trillion dollars or, or, or probably close to ten trillion dollars, which is exactly what happened. The national debt's thirty four trillion dollars, but at the beginning of Trump's um, administration it was um, uh, about twenty one and then Trump ramped it up to the uh, the high twenties and then Biden took it right to thirty four which is where it is now, and the debt-to-GDP ratio is 125%, mm -hmm. highest in history. Guys, show the debt clock where we can just sh we just show oh, yeah. the 1.1 trillion that was just added. Right. I mean, it, now the and you're going to be, if our numbers are right, 50% of the deficit in the out years is going to be just to pay the interest. Yeah. And right. I, so you got that problem as well. But it, so, so there we are. We're at 1.1 trillion in four months. Yeah. So we're at this point now where. And by the way, if you know all the acronyms and all the every, we've actually done all the work. So if I screw anything up, great. I, I I'm not in this world to know every fucking government acronym on government spending and right. every stupid ass plan that they come up with. Like yeah. if whatever they are, that's what it is. Yeah. And we're at the stage now where uh, institutional clients, if there's one thing they ask me, about it's like, okay, where's the rate of change of inflation? Where's the rate of change of growth in your models? Blah 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 blah. But what about this, this debt and yeah. deficit thing? Like the, people are numb to this. Like in the sense that the numbers are so big and getting so much bigger so much faster right. that people are just under the impression that this doesn't actually matter anymore. Well, But my question is, does it bring it back to structural inflation? Okay, okay. first of all, bo both things are correct. It, people are under the impression that it doesn't actually matter. And that is modern monetary theory. And my friend Stephanie Kelton, yes. she's the big brain, you know, professor at SUNY, uh, um, Stony Brook, I believe that, that's her campus. Uh, she She's wrote, the only person, by the way, that won't do a real conversation with me. Even laser eyes, Mike Saylor did one. Yeah. I mean, fair, fair I enough. wonder why. Yeah, yeah. She, I've invited her. I've, I've met her. I know her. I've invited her to, you know, we'll have a debate. So I can find a host. We get a studio somewhere. She won't do it. Um, <laughs> but, but I rec I recommend her book, The Deficit Myth. Yep. Um, every every single thing in that book is wrong. But you should read it to understand how they okay. think. Yeah, it's yeah. like you know, I used to uh, I used to be Pravda during the Cold War, and people say, well, "Jim, why do you read it? It's all lies." I go, "That's why I read it, because you want to know what your enemy's lying about, because that's what matters to them." Yeah. There's an inferential thing that you can do there. So read that book. It's all wrong, but it's it's an encyclopedia of all the wrong thinking. By the way, she's not you know she's she's the big brain of this, and there was a uh, some a Bard College I think is a has a think tank on this, but. Um, she was, uh, she was the advisor to Bernie Sanders when he was head of the Senate um, uh, Banking Committee. I'm oh, sorry, the, the Budget Committee. So when the Democrats had the majority in the Senate, Bernie Sanders ran the budget, and she was his advisor, 
and an advisor to his 2016 campaign. I'm not sure she, I don't know what she was doing in 2020. But the point is, she goes way back. She has a Hill career and just to an academic career. Uh, and actually, her inspiration uh, was um, Warren Mosler. Mm -hmm. You may know Adam's Warren Mosler, but. Uh, Weird dude. Yeah, well, I bump, just bump into him in the, in the um, St. Croix because I lived down there for a couple of years. Uh, but he was running for a, a non voting congressman from St. Croix, so I used to listen to his commercials on the way to work. But uh, yeah, but uh, I'll spare everyone the story. Uh, uh, he, uh, Warren got his kids to do chores by paying them in his business cards, printed money in other words. And he said, then when you c accumulate these business cards, you can, and if you want like an allowance or something, you can come to me with however many business cards, and I'll redeem them for a certain amount, and then you can go to the movies or you know whatever, whatever you do. And I guess Stephanie was like a house guest, and she saw this and goes, aha, you can print as many business cards as you want. Mm -hmm. And then she just kind of took it from there. But it, I doubt there are more than two or three members of Congress who can say modern monetary theory, but they're all practicing it. Yes. It has taken over the mindset in Washington. It, hey, and then they go, hey, look at Japan. Their debt to GDP is uh, 300 percent. We've got a long way to go. We're, I mean, she, we're she, only is so, she is so, I still follow her on Twitter. Now I'm going to get blocked, but whatever. <laughs> I have other ways to get the information. But she's so cocky right now about oh, this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because they got to do it without asking for congressional approval for it. Right. I mean, it's like Janet Yellen is like, she's. You, She's nobody's idiot when it comes to, well, the, the, we can talk about that word, yeah. but she's nobody's idiot when, when it comes to understanding full well what she was doing. Right. With this QRA, MMT. Yeah. Again, 24% of jobs yeah. well, Jenny were, 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 were government jobs. Yeah, Jenny Allen is the downside of affirmative action, but she, she's not stupid. She has a very high IQ, but she's, uh, she doesn't know what she's doing. Uh, but, but she knows she she thinks they oh, the, know what the they're doing. Oh yeah, like these numbers didn't they came from that architecture? Right. So let's get. It back. wasn't voted on. So so going back to we started Keith with, with the um, debt to GDP ratio, one hundred and twenty five percent. Okay, we're there for a lot of reasons, and, and every both parties are are in on it. But what does it actually mean? And and that was the question you asked. And we actually we know the answer to that. We've got decades of empirical. We know the answer, but nobody's. They're just now asking the question. You're right. Oh, geez, this is a big number. And what I say is over 34 trillion is a big, scary number, but it means nothing unless you compare it to GDP, unless you look yep. at the ratio. Because I say, you know, if you owe $50,000 on a MasterCard, uh, if you make $500,000, no big deal. You write a check. If you make $20,000, you're probably going broke. So you, you don't, you can't get any information out of the $50,000 balance. You have to say, how much money am I making relative to that balance? So now, getting back to uh, debt to GDP, 34 trillion doesn't mean anything unless you put it in the context of GDP, which is how much you're making. In other words, what's your economy actually worth? Um, and now, uh, uh, Carmen Reinhardt, who's the chief economist at the World Bank, and Ken Rogoff is a, um, a full professor at Harvard, and uh, Carmen was at Harvard and University of Maryland before she went to the World Bank. They, uh, they wrote that book. You know, uh, this time is different. Great book, but they've done a ton of empirical research coming out in their papers. I recommend reading, the book's mm -hmm. good, but I recommend reading their papers. Well, uh, th this time is different by Reinhardt? Yeah, Reinhardt. Yeah, because Ryan, Ryan yeah, it, it shows you hundreds of years of deficits and debts and Correct. what, and what they, the outcomes became. And, right, and they've done, they've done yeah. a lot more since the book came out, mm -hmm. and they've sliced it every which way. Developed economies only, developing economies only, mm -hmm. last 10 years, last 100 years. You know, so they, they've sliced it, and they always get the same result, which is the following. I know this is going to upset a lot of people, but I'm going to mention the word uh, uh, Keynesian multiplier. There is such a thing as a Keynesian multiplier. It's not a free lunch, but it is true that at certain levels of debt to GDP, and I'll take 30% as it, we, by the way, when Ronald Reagan was sworn in, it was 30%. It was actually, we took it down from 120 to 30 in the 35 years from uh, the end of World War II to Reagan being sworn in. Uh, and that was, that was bipartisan. That was Truman. Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon. It was never a partisan issue. It was like, let's just get this under control. But at those levels, assuming you don't just burn the money, there is a Keynesian multiplier, and so you can borrow a dollar, spend a dollar, and get a dollar twenty-five of GDP. That mm -hmm. actually works. Whether it was money well spent, separate issue. Whether it's sustainable, separate issue. But you can borrow a dollar, spend a dollar, get a dollar twenty-five. But the problem is there are diminishing marginal returns. As the debt to GDP ratio goes up, that multiplier goes down. Yeah. 
So where, what's the critical threshold, as a physicist would say, even from complexity theory, where is the point at which it becomes less than a dollar? So now you borrow a dollar, you spend a dollar, but you get 90 cents of GDP. Mm. Where's that point? The best answer is right around 90% debt to GDP. Mm -hmm. That's why the Maastricht Treaty uh, that governs uh, uh, EU fiscal policy was set at 60%. That's, Angela Merkel thought that was way too high, but it was a good cushion to 90. They kind of knew about the 90, at least intuitively. And <laughs> the Reinhard kind of Rogue, kind of Reinhard, they, Well, Reinhard Rogge approved it, but that was, the, that was their 60 is way too high because you're getting too close to 90. Well, we're at 125. I mean, who's at our lunch table? It's Lebanon, Italy, and Greece. Right, that's that's our crowd. So, um, but when you go past ninety, it gets worse. In other words, that multiplier gets smaller and smaller. Yep. So, in the fourth quarter of twenty twenty three, and I realize it's just one quarter. You need a longer time series. That number, and this is to your point, that number was zero point six seven. We borrowed a dollar, spent a dollar, and we got sixty seven cents of GDP. So, to answer your question, do you get GDP? Yeah, we actually had a pretty good quarter of GDP, but we didn't get, we, but we borrowed more than we gained, which means if you're increasing the numerator by a dollar and you're increasing the uh, denominator by uh, 67 cents, you, what's happening? Your debt to GDP ratio is getting worse. In other words, you can't borrow your way out of a debt crisis. Uh, and you, you can keep borrowing, you can keep spending, you can keep generating GDP, but the GDP gets less and less and less relative to the dollar you borrowed. The numerator get, gets bigger, the denominator gets bigger at a slower rate, which means the ratio is getting worse. And what's the other consequence of that? Slower growth. It doesn't mean the world comes to an end. It doesn't mean we, we default the next day. You get slower and slower growth, which is consistent with the depression thesis punctuated by recessions, which we have along the way. Um, and so then, just to, to, to wrap up, uh, <laughs> I'm, I happen to be a lawyer, so I'll do a summation. Reinhard and Rogoff asked the next question, well, what happens when you actually get into this situation? And they said, one of three things. The first one is default. So that's the Argentina case. So you, but that's because they can't print. They borrow in dollars and print pesos. They can't print dollars. Exactly. So you just default. Yeah. And you can set your watch by Argentina. Like every eight, nine years, they default. Okay, default is one. Second one, you know, a little fancier uh, dress is... Um, uh, restructuring, which is what the IMF does. So you don't actually default, but, I, but well, this is what they did with Greece in 2015, ex 2015. Extend the maturities, lower the interest rate, change the terms, uh, you know, smooth it out a little bit, and, and do a refinancing and keep going. Mm -hmm. There is no reason for the United States to default, because we can print the dollars. There are consequences, but we can print the dollars. There's no reason for the U.S. to conduct a restructuring because we can print the dollars. So we don't need to do any of that. It's usually, it's, it's really for countries that borrow one currency and print yeah, another. Exactly. Doesn't work. We don't have to do that. So what's the third? Hyperinflation. Exactly. Then that's the American Bingo. way. That's well, the American way. It's an amazing thing. I mean, you do have at the household, I mean, let's just put it on the table. Two thirds of Americans have no money, no savings left. So when we're really talking about the economy, back to your point about the averages. Right. If you're Mr. Average Guy, you're average. You're not like a real stochastic modern day yeah. like bean counter. Like right. you don't use machines. You don't use. You love AI, but you don't want to use it. You know, you, you want to be a linear. You know, like kind of like a spy monkey. Right. Like you're just sitting there and you're you're doing that. But your rendition there of of this time is different, and all of that empirical data that is goes back as far as time does. Correct. Was awesome. Yeah. And what I did, like you made me, you always make me think on the fly. Um, somebody sent me this text, I'm going to sh show it right now, the other side of the trade, because of course you get GDP if you do two things, which they did. You understate inflation, the deflator, we don't have to get into that, but at one and a half percent. Right. One and a half. The number's three, three, four, three, five, maybe four, four, or five. Mm -hmm. One and a half. So now GDP magically goes up because the deflator didn't, you know, didn't go up that much. Right. And then on the other side, you borrow from your kid's future and you hire a bunch of people with that. And they get jobs, yeah, right. So, and and you just went through that. There's again Keynesian multiplier. Well right. done. So what, what what I what I got this text. This is this is amazing. This is just trying to explain this to a two year old or uh, maybe maybe a ten year old, right? So and you can see it up here. So you take like lesson number one: U.S. tax revenues at the top, you know, federal budget, new debt, national debt, recent budget cuts, etc. Now let's take out eight zeros. Yep. Eight zeros, and this is you know, your family income is twenty one thousand seven hundred dollars. Money the family spent, $38,000. New debt on the credit card, another $16,500. Yeah. Outstanding balance on the credit card, $142,000. Right. Total budget cut so far, $38.50. Right. 
So, okay. <laughs> it's like, you can, people can understand this. Now, you, I don't know why, why there's no a politician in America that doesn't run on that, on that text that I got. Well, I'll, I'll give it, by the way, great question, great point, I'll give you an answer. You understand it, I understand it, the text understands it, and I think a nine-year-old would understand it. I have very little doubt about that. ChatGPT definitely understands it. Uh, well, <laughs> then give me started. That's a whole yeah, other, it's a different rabbit hole. Yeah, it's a whole other conversation. <laughs> uh, not so sure. Uh, just as a quick aside, I spoke to, I, I, I don't want to, it's not fair to disclose his name, and I won't, but a mega, mega cap tech CEO. Yeah. That was shortlist. Um, and I said, uh, yes, I'm trying to figure out the GPT thing. It looks to me like a speed reading plagiarist. And he said, you're right. You see, that's about it. He, I said, speed reading plagiarist? He goes, that's about what it is. Yeah. You know, it's just a novelty kind of thing. But um, I but, meant more like I, ta I take what I write. Right. Because I write to Wall Street, which a nine or 10 year old can't really understand. <laughs> and then I just tell it, to, can you put this in 500 words or less? And yeah. to a 10 year old, that works. Yeah. And I think that that, that text works in terms of explaining Right. How upside down and and you know, but what madness this budget and deficit has become? Yeah, but you can you can do that because you are a genuine subject matter expert. So I think a subject matter expert using GPT for some output and then like proofreading it, tweak it, yep. and send it out, that works. But but if you have to be a subject matter expert to make sure the GPT output is okay, what about all the college kids? What about all the non-experts? What about all the everyday yeah. Americans who are using it, taking it at face value, and don't have really the capacity point. to read it critically? Yeah. That's the thing. I took a test where uh, there were two, uh, the, they, they went to uh, GPT, and they went to a bright uh, college student, I think a senior, and they asked him to write a 900-word essay on the war in Ukraine, uh, causes of the war in Ukraine in the early stages of whatever. And they published them both uh, anonymously, so you didn't know, so the test was, could you read them both and figure out which one was GPT? I, I read one sentence, one sentence, I said, that's the robot, and then I read the rest of it, I read the other essay, I had it on one sentence, um, and I was right, but, um, but it was because it was a, a cliche, but that's what GPT does. GPT, if you read a billion pages, certain things are gonna jump out of you more often than not, they're called cliches or bad writing. And, but, the, but that's the training set, and the algorithms in the GPT are like, well, people say this a lot, so maybe that's what I ought to say. So when you find like a lot of cliches that almost don't work, but it was, it was not, it was grammatical. It was grammatical, it right. was spelled correct. All that stuff was good, but it's like, this is really bad writing. And you actually, um, you actually have to be a really good writer to write really badly without getting noticed. I don't know, it was like Hemingway's Torrance of Spring. Uh, but, but, um, but it was easy. It was easy to spot the robot. So put that aside. Back to the... You have a book coming out on that. I, <laughs> Which, I, by the I, way, I told the team we'd be done in an hour. So now, uh, of course, we only have three minutes left. Uh, but you have a book I on the subject. I have a book coming out on... Uh, uh, it's coming out in November. It's a little too soon. We've still got a working title, working on the cover art. And the, we don't have our Amazon land, landing page. We will by the summer. And cool. I'll start banging the drum. But I've been Im immersed in it for over a year. I would just say uh, two things for um, investors. Um, AI is real, it's powerful, it's, it's got a role. It's, it's been around for a while, by the way, but it, it's gonna have a potentially more, a more powerful role. ChatGPT, it's a tool, it's a writing tool. It's like spell check, but it's, it's not a lot more than that. It's a little bit of a gimmick. There's a lot less there than meets the eye. So for the hardware guys, you know, AMD, uh, Intel, Nvidia, yeah, they're gonna do great. I don't, I, I don't have a view on whether stocks are overvalued or not, but the companies are solid and, they, and their, their product is in demand. The software side of it, the providers, Microsoft, OpenAI, um, Facebook, uh, YouTube, which is part of Google, and I'll include Google, uh, and a few others, uh, I have one thing to say. They're the gatekeepers on the output of AI and GPT. They're writing the algorithms. They're writing the deep layered neural networks. They have got, they, these are the exact same people who have lied to us for four years. They lied about vaccines, they lied about masks, they lied about social distancing, they lied about the war in Ukraine. Sorry, Russia's rolling up the entire battlefront, and we don't have time to go through that, but they are, it's not a stalemate. Russia's on the move. They, they lied about certain aspects of 2020. They lied about everything, but now all of a sudden, they're the gatekeepers of the output of AI GPT. We're supposed to believe them? Mm. Wow. Really good. Yeah, and, and open, so, no, open. No, 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 really. I didn't mean really good, like it's for really, society. No, it's really, really good and thought. And there's a lot more to it. But OpenAI, I was kind of given, I was sort of given them a pass because they're new, 
and I was hoping they would be better. It turns out they're not. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they've, they, one of their big benefactors, the money behind them, they've created a new uh, misinformation filter for the 2024 election, as soon as I saw that. Uh, but that money was coming from Mackenzie Scott. So that's kind of all I needed to know. Mm-hmm. Man, I mean, uh, and you were going to finish before I got you going on AI on tying this back, like just real world well, what I'll, a budget I'll, I'll, is. I'll, I'll tie it back, which is the answer to the question, G Jim, if, if, the, if you compare this to a family budget and do the math or whatever, take off six zeros, et cetera, this doesn't work, it's not sustainable, we're waiting for a disaster, which we are. Sorry to be talking <laughs> fast, but, but which we are. Uh, why doesn't the Congress get that? Why doesn't the Treasury get that? Why are they on board? Because modern monetary theory says the opposite. They would say, yeah, that's all true, but it doesn't matter. Yep. You can print as much as you want. I mean, Stephanie Kelton went so far, the reason I read her book is I like to get the exact quotes, not you know, infer things. She said, we don't even need the U.S. Treasury securities market. So the, the U.S. Treasury securities market exists as a favor to investors mm. to give them a place to park their money. Mm. We don't actually need it. Mm. All we need to do is call the Fed, give them wire instructions to Lockheed Martin. She said this. Call the Fed, give them wire instructions to Lockheed Martin, send the money for however many F-35s. Why do you need a bond market to do that? <laughs> the problem with... M Sounds like she's traded a lot of markets. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the problem with MMT is that they, they pose questions like that, and most people are stymied. They're like, well, actually, what's wrong with that? Why couldn't you just send the money right to Lockheed Martin? But I'll give you, I'll give you the answer. And it goes back to Warren, Mo, Warren Moses' kids and the business cards. Every model she uses is a closed system. We don't have a closed system. And they, these people, and I'll start with Stephanie, but there's a, there's a bunch of them, they know what they know. Here's what they don't know. They don't understand foreign exchange markets. They don't understand the euro dollar market. They don't understand that there are a lot of ways to strike at the US dollar other than defaulting on the debt, which are exchange rates, inflation, some of the things we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. So that's the that's the kind of the master class for people who believe in MMT. Yeah, and that's what you and I, like, well, we'll get plenty of things right and wrong. I mean, that's where we, in principle, and you know, principle line of analytical attack agree. Right. Like, we don't start with the world being a closed system. We start with the opposite. Right. It's, it's a constantly evolving, nonlinear and dynamic ecosystem like everything else in the Correct. world. Right? Correct. And so to have an expectation that you can do all this and just say soft landing, no recession, et cetera, right. and there's no other side of the trade, which I think we've concluded is right. higher inflation for longer than you think. Correct. Much, potentially much higher. Right. You know, then that's the answer. And it all goes back to the great Mundell because Mundell said that there, there are three... There are three variables: there's the exchange rate, the interest rate, and capital controls. You can have, you can pick any two out of three, but you can't. The third one will will come back to haunt you. You can't control all three. You can control two out of three. If you fix interest rates and and uh, close the capital account, you're going to your currency is going to get crushed. Or if you have um, uh, free exchange rates and open capital account, forget about interest rates. You're just going to follow the Fed. So he said you can have two out of three, but not all three. But that's why, to your point, it's not a closed system. Mm -hmm. Well done, and looking forward to your uh, thoughts. Again, whatever Jim thinks on AI, what, his, his books will make you think. That's the, that's the point, right? Yeah, All chat GPT, people just want what they want. They, they're lazy, they want a shortcut, they want the answer fast, whether it's right or wrong, it's what I started with. It yeah. takes zero knowledge to believe. Right. Right? Yeah. So believe me, we're uh, gonna think critically and analytically here, so thank you uh, for joining Jim and I, and Jim, thank you very much.